office. This is the original engraving office. And they moved us back here. But it was just windowless and a bunch of cubicles. It was like an office office, yeah. like office space, you know, like the, like the movie. <laughs> it just wasn't, like, conducive to creativity. Yeah. Describe the challenge of taking somebody else's art and turning it into a sculpture for point. Well, when your work as a commercial sculptor, which is what I consider us, you know, or I consider myself to be here at the Mint, you essentially get... Uh, des when you get a design, I essentially look at it as a brief, and that brief is uh, what the brief is a set of instructions that need to be observed in order to resolve the final three-dimensional model um, into a usable form. Now, sometimes we have to modify that, make some changes in order to make it more um, coinable, but they're usually changes for the sake of. Um, technical reasons, not artistic reasons. The artistic intent has already been approved by the Secretary of the Treasury and also the various committees that vet the, the coin designs along the way. You still have to interpret somebody else's art. Yes and no. I mean, the, the, like, it, you could see here, if my computer was not behaving slowly, there's the artwork there, um, superimposed over the design. And you can see it matches pretty closely. My goal is to take that artwork and use it as a map, with, uh, use it as a map from which I generate the sculpture. Um, ideally, I'm drawing, I'm sculpting my own design. I mean, that's the ultimate goal, is to be able to sculpt your own design, but they don't, we don't always get picked. And, you know, sometimes you get to sign this or you get to sign that. The, um, there's always a challenge of transcribing to flat two-dimensional art into three-dimensional art, and that's that's something that's interesting. But um, I would look at it more as a partnership between the two-dimensional artist and the three-dimensional artist, rather than just simply um, blindly. We're not just copying in three dimensions. It's more of a transcription. So does you know? the consultation process continue between the no, designer and no, the engraver? No. I mean, technically, if you need more information from the artist, you, you, we have to go through our uh, proper channels at the Mint and get permission to contact the artist and say, hey, you know, what were you thinking when you did this foot? This foot's too short or something like that. You know, that kind of thing. But um, I typically don't have that experience. That's very rare from what I've seen. Um, I just figure if I get a design, it's already been vetted and that's good enough for me. My task is to um, reproduce that design as faithfully as I can in three dimensions. So what is the typical turnaround for you to take a two-dimensional design that's passed through the process and render it into the final form? I, I can go anywhere from a couple days to a couple weeks. Um, and then what happens is we have internal review um, bodies that can request changes, so that can add to the process time-wise. Um, but for me to just do a straight sculpt, do one in like four days, three, four days, five days maybe, um, used to take me longer than that. If it's something really involved, it could take me up to two weeks, maybe longer. But I would say anywhere from a couple days to a couple weeks. So you've uh, worked in both uh, physical tools and uh, digital tools to create coin art or metal art. Yes. What, what, are, what are the difficulties inherent with the digital form that don't exist when you're actually doing it by hand? I don't think there are inherent, any difficulties inherent. I've heard other artists say that they have difficulty seeing the mo seeing the model and with the you, you, you seeing ac accurate depth perception, but I don't find that I have that problem because I've been sculpting coins digitally for ten years now. I know when I sculpt this how to anticipate what it's going to look like. Um, computers behaving slowly in metal. What it's going to um, what it's going to look like at, at, at coin scale, and I'm, I'm just using this for demonstration. I mean, like, I literally know, even if I'm sculpting it this big, 
what that's going to look like on a coin that's this big, just from experience. Right. So because of my experience, I don't really have that problem of anticipation of the final product. So what are some additional capabilities that make themselves available to an artist in this form that wouldn't exist the other way? It's a question of taste. I know artists here feel that uh, working in plaster is the ultimate medium for creating coins. And it has been for centuries, right? Well, excuse me, it has been for a century or so. Because prior to the uh, end of the 19th century, coins were actually sculpted at, in, at scale before the Jean Vier machines and stuff. So they were sculpted in, in different media. So, but for a good 100 plus years, but no, even going back to the 18th, 19th, in 19th, 18th and 17th centuries, they still sculpted metals um, at, at, different, at different sizes in plaster. So it has been used for centuries as far as I understand. Um, you can't argue with that, right? This is a different medium. It's not better, it's not worse, it's different. It's like comparing acoustic guitar to electric guitar, in my opinion. You know, is Eddie Van Halen any less of a virtuoso if he plays Eruption on an acoustic guitar or on an electric guitar? No, they just have different sounds, right. in my opinion. So, uh, you know, I guess in numismatics, a lot of collectors look at older designs, the uh, Augusta St. Gaudens designs or uh, Fraser's designs, uh, and they look at a lot of these older designs have a lot of give and take, you know. Um, hidden detail that are only alluded to and it seems like modern designs are a little bit more literal a little bit um, perhaps uh, more in detail We're, that's forced upon us because it's the um, uh, the whole idea of people want to collectors want to see proof sets they want to see polished coins right. so in order to have proof polish a coin you pretty much need to have a pretty crisp, this is just my opinion. You need to have a crisp border. I need to have a crisp border around all of these edges in order f so that when they go to polish it, they don't rub anything away or burnish it off. Right. So because we have the polished fields, we have the very crisp outlines on all the artwork. Now, if you look at our metallic work, that's different. In the metallic work, Three, three inch metals, stuff f fades into the field. Right. Things become a little more nebulous. You know, there's more of that artistic freedom in the pal on the pal the palette of the metal. The palette that the metal provides is more artistic, I think, than the, that we have available on coins. Could we do coins differently? Sure, but that's for someone above my pay grade to decide. So make sure I understand. It would be a fascinating answer because I never considered it. Yeah. Like I said. So what you're saying is that because of the demand for proof coinage, where you have that deep frosted cameo on the devices and that mirrored, that separation essentially yes. between the devices and the fields, that requires a lot more accentuation of every detail on the raised elements, and other or it won't it won't strike up. Well, it requires a border along around everything. So if you're going to have that border that's all crisp and detailed, I mean, the stuff that follows on the inside, some of that can be softer and whatnot, but it's that, I think it's that crisp outline, you know, everywhere that's going to give you that pop. Everything seems to pop. So what's your favorite executed design that you've worked on? My favorite executed design is the Flight 93 Heroes of 9-11 Shanksville Memorial um, Congressional Gold Medal. It's a bunch of trees and a, the rock and uh, from the site uh, fading into the field and it was um, I liked it because of the way I was able to sculpt it in a more artistic fashion but also because of the, his the historical significance of the metal and the fact that it actually became part of the permanent memorial in Shanksville Pennsylvania, Shanksville, Pennsylvania. for me that's just the highest honor that I, I could hope to have that's um, a pretty incredible design yeah, I think. oh you saw it? Yes, thanks man yeah, yeah. yeah. The United States Mint puts out a tremendous volume of new designs each year uh, through the quarter program, the dollar program, um, commemorative coins and congressional medals. Uh, how difficult is it to keep up with the pace of the new products? No, it's not difficult at all. We have a fully adequately um, staffed team. Uh, we everything seems to dovetail. In, everything seems to dovetail nicely. Our scheduling team is adept at making sure that everything's 
lined up in the right order. And uh, between drawing and sculpting, we just have um, a full amount, of, a full enough amount of work to keep us challenged, but not so much that we get overwhelmed. In my opinion, I mean, it's it's. Um, I don't mean comfortable as in relaxing. I mean it's just. I have enough time to, to make sure that a good enough job is done. Okay, last question for you. No problem. Um, if you could make any theme um, uh, into a coin for the United States that hasn't been done yet, or what, what would you choose? I think we should do a series of heroes of American history. You know, going back from the founding fathers all the way up to the present, you know, different types of... Uh, uh, different groups of society represented, you know, native peoples, um, peoples from all different, all different cultures that have formed the melting pot that makes America, all the different heroes from, the, from, these vari from this diverse body of, of um, Americans to the present day, I think would be interesting. Okay, I made up uh, my last. I have one more question. That's fine. Okay. Um, so since you've designed so many coins that are in circulation, do you ever go through your change to see if you've designed anything in your pocket? Yeah, when I go to the store, I see a lot of, I see a lot of change, um, quarters in particular. But the thing that's like the neatest thing is um, Lyndall Bass designed the reverse of the 2010 penny, but I got to sculpt it. So my initials are on the back of the penny. So no matter where I go, I'm always going to see you know, the penny with the shield on it. So being able to tell my kids, you know, when they pick up a penny that, there's your dad's initials, there's your pop's initials in the back of the penny. That's pretty cool. That's one I say all the time when, when we're interviewed, but it's one that it never gets old. It's really an honor to be able to have had the chance to participate in history like that. There's literally billions of pieces of your art out there. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Cool. Thanks a lot. No problem. Thank you. Nice to talk to you.